The United States has cautioned Canada against backing out of its purchase of American-made F-35 fighter jets, warning it of potential fallout if the deal is scrapped. Locked in a trade fight with Donald Trump, you may have heard that the Carney government is reconsidering its multi-billion dollar purchase of American F-35 fighter jets. Ottawa sticking to its plan to buy Lockheed 7 or F-35 fighter jets. So last week, Prime Minister Mark Carney ordered a review of Canada's contract to buy 88 F-35 fighter jets. NATO's attention snapped into focus in an unexpected way. And it did not come from a battlefield or a tense summit. It came from a workshop floor and a decision made quietly inside one of Britain's most powerful engineering firms. Rolls-Royce, a name tied to luxury and civilian aviation, stepped into the fighter jet arena and altered a conversation that NATO planners thought was settled. The aircraft at the center of it all was the Saab Gripen, a jet often overlooked while the spotlight stayed on heavyweights like the F-35 and the Eurofighter. Then the upgrade happened. Performance numbers shifted, assumptions cracked, and defense analysts across Europe and the Pentagon started paying close attention. A fighter once labeled an underdog suddenly forced serious questions about air power, alliances, and future combat planning. How did a single upgrade trigger that reaction? What exactly changed inside the Gripen, and why did NATO not see it coming? Let's break it all down. Rolls-Royce did far more than improve a piece of machinery, and the real significance only becomes clear after understanding why the Gripen exists in the first place. This aircraft was never built to dominate air shows or serve as a political symbol. It was designed to fight wars under real conditions, often far from pristine bases and ideal support networks. While the F-35 carries a price tag that climbs beyond $100 million per aircraft and depends on complex logistics chains, and while the Eurofighter demands extensive infrastructure and manpower, the Gripen was shaped around a different philosophy. It was built to take off from short runways and ordinary roads, to operate in Arctic cold, to be maintained quickly by small crews, and to return to the air again and again with a high sortie rate. Its entire structure favors data-centric combat, rapid response and survival in environments where support is limited and weather is unforgiving. Yet for years, critics repeated the same argument. The Gripen was efficient and clever, but it lacked raw power. That belief shaped procurement debates across NATO and kept the aircraft out of serious contention against heavier, more expensive fighters. That perception collapsed the moment Rolls-Royce became deeply involved, and the Alliance did not recognize the shift until it was already underway. During the late stages of the Gripen E program, a quiet partnership moved into action involving Saab, GE Aviation, and Rolls-Royce. On paper, Rolls-Royce appeared as a co-producer of the F414 engine, which forms the core of the Gripen E's propulsion system. Publicly, the role looked routine, limited to manufacturing support and quality assurance. Privately, something much larger was unfolding. Engineers at Rolls-Royce were assigned a mandate that went well beyond assembly. They were asked to optimize, modernize, and re-engineer critical subsystems of the F414 to meet Sweden's demanding operational requirements. Those requirements were shaped by icy roads, rapid deployments, electronic warfare heavy environments, and constant readiness. A contract that began as technical cooperation quietly evolved into one of the most discreet performance transformations in modern military aviation. NATO nations remained largely unaware until classified evaluations began circulating and raised eyebrows across defense ministries. Military sources later described four major areas where Rolls-Royce delivered improvements. None of them announced themselves with dramatic headlines, yet together they changed how the Gripen performed and how it was perceived. The first involved thermal signature reduction. Rolls-Royce engineers reworked exhaust flow management and internal cooling channels to stabilize heat output and reduce infrared visibility. This adjustment made the Gripen E significantly harder to track and target using infrared search and track systems and surface-to-air missile sensors. Systems such as Russia's S-400, Panzer S-1, and the IRST platforms integrated into aircraft like the Su-35 rely heavily on thermal cues. 
By masking and smoothing those cues, the Gripen gained a survivability edge that analysts quietly referred to as intelligent stealth, a form of concealment achieved through engineering rather than coatings or extreme airframe shaping. The second upgrade focused on the engine's power curve. Instead of chasing headline-grabbing maximum thrust numbers, Rolls-Royce optimized performance where combat pilots actually need it. Low altitude acceleration improved, high altitude fuel efficiency increased, and power delivery during aggressive maneuvers became more responsive and predictable. This reshaping of power output altered how the aircraft behaved during dogfights, missile evasion, and sustained high G turns. Pilots described the experience as smoother, faster to respond, and easier to control under pressure. The aircraft no longer felt constrained by its engine during dynamic engagements, and that alone rewrote assumptions about the Gripen's limitations. The third area involved electronic control algorithms. Rolls-Royce quietly updated the FADEC system, the digital brain that governs engine behavior. These changes improved timing, throttle responsiveness, and coordination between the engine and onboard systems. More importantly, the updates enhanced how the engine interacted with the Gripen E's sensor fusion and electronic warfare architecture. The Arexis electronic warfare suite could now operate at full power without degrading engine performance or forcing compromises elsewhere. Previously, power allocation limits created trade-offs between propulsion and electronic dominance. That ceiling disappeared. The aircraft gained the ability to push sensors, jammers and defensive systems to their limits while maintaining stable and efficient engine output. The fourth improvement addressed reliability under extreme conditions. The Gripen E was already intended to operate from icy roads and dispersed bases, but Rolls-Royce pushed those capabilities further. Engine tolerance for foreign object ingestion increased, resilience to rapid temperature shifts improved, and maintenance requirements were simplified for field-level crews. The design emphasized one crew serviceability and faster turnaround times. As a result, downtime dropped by as much as 40% compared to older configurations. For air forces that measure combat power in available aircraft rather than brochure specifications, this change mattered deeply. NATO fighter wings reviewing the data were caught off guard. The Gripen was never expected to compete directly with the F-35. Yet in several mission profiles, it now began to outperform it quietly and consistently. That performance shift triggered a geopolitical ripple that extended far beyond engineering discussions. European air forces have long relied on American engines, avionics and weapons policies. Rolls-Royce's work demonstrated that Europe could field a high-end fighter with reduced dependence on the United States. This realization unsettled planners across NATO. The upgraded Gripen E unlocked capabilities that challenged long-held assumptions, including electronic warfare effectiveness, approaching that of the F-35, supercruise-like performance in specific flight profiles, improved survivability against advanced air defense systems, and significantly lower cost per flight hour than any Western competitor. Procurement discussions began to change tone. Countries such as Canada, Finland, the Czech Republic, the Philippines and Hungary revisited earlier decisions and reassessed long-term needs. This shift was never part of the original plan. The shock became tangible when Canadian defence analysts leaked evaluations focused on Arctic operations. The findings surprised even seasoned observers. In cold weather scenarios, remote basing and long-distance patrol missions, the Gripen E equipped with Rolls-Royce optimizations exceeded expectations. Canada operates in one of the harshest aviation environments on the planet, with vast distances, limited infrastructure and freezing temperatures. Interceptor readiness and reliability matter more than theoretical stealth advantages. Evaluations suggested that the F-35 struggled in several of these categories, while the Gripen thrived. Reports indicated that Ottawa requested classified briefings specifically addressing the Rolls-Royce upgrades. Questions followed rapidly. Pentagon officials sought clarity on how such modifications occurred without direct American oversight. Concerns emerged about export controls, co-development pathways, and the future of fighter standardization within NATO. 
defence lobbying intensified in Washington, with warnings that a Canadian pivot toward the Gripen could influence other nations. The aircraft became politically threatening, not because of aggression, but because of choice. What Rolls-Royce ultimately changed extended beyond metal and software. The company altered the fighter ecosystem itself. A non-American aircraft gained the credibility to challenge decades of dominance in NATO fighter sales. A European platform demonstrated competitive electronic warfare capability without relying on American gatekeeping. A more affordable aircraft began matching systems tied to the most expensive defense program in history. The balance inside NATO shifted quietly. A new category emerged, defined by elite performance paired with realistic cost. The Gripen came to symbolize independence, efficiency, survivability and modular growth without political strings attached. That was the surprise NATO never anticipated. The broader implications extend into a new phase of military planning. Escalating defense budgets no longer guarantee superiority. A compact, efficient, electronically capable fighter built in Sweden and powered by British engineering began rewriting assumptions across alliance capitals. The Gripen evolved into one of the most strategically independent aircraft in the Western arsenal, forcing NATO to confront difficult questions about procurement, control and long-term autonomy. The transformation did not announce itself loudly, yet its effects continue to spread. As that debate unfolded, another development added urgency to the conversation. One of the world's most neutral and disciplined nations raised concerns that echoed across defence circles. In early 2024, Switzerland issued a warning about the F-35 that resonated far beyond its borders. Known for precision, caution and financial rigour, Switzerland does not approach defence procurement casually. This is a country that remained neutral through two world wars and rejects weapons deals that fail to meet strict standards of cost, sovereignty and independence. When Swiss officials speak, planners listen. Switzerland selected the F-35 in 2021, a decision many viewed as final validation of the program. The assumption was that if Switzerland approved, doubts were over. That confidence did not last. After contracts were signed, revised cost assessments emerged in 2023 and 2024. Operating expenses exceeded earlier projections. Inflation and pricing adjustments altered long-term assumptions. Sustainment costs lost their predictability. Swiss officials acknowledged something deeply uncomfortable. Full control over lifetime expenses was no longer guaranteed. For a country built on fiscal discipline, this represented a serious warning sign. The issue extended beyond money. Control became the central concern. Mission data files remained under American authority. Software updates required approval. Certain maintenance activities depended on external authorization. Ownership proved conditional. Access replaced autonomy. Swiss analysts began asking what would happen if political priorities shifted in Washington. Those questions carried enormous weight for Canada. Unlike Switzerland, Canada cannot rely on neutrality. It must defend the world's longest coastline, patrol vast Arctic territories and operate across extreme distances with limited infrastructure. Absolute autonomy matters. Climate-controlled hangars, centralized logistics and limited cold weather operational history raised doubts. Alternatives designed for dispersed operations and subarctic environments began to look increasingly relevant. Switzerland's warning forced a fundamental reassessment of priorities. Data control added another layer. The F-35 relies on cloud-based diagnostics, centralized mission systems and continuous software verification. Swiss officials expressed concern about cyber exposure, reliance on foreign servers and operational delays during crises. For Canada, those risks multiply. In a high-tension Arctic scenario, delays tied to external approval cycles could undermine defence readiness. Switzerland did not deliver a dramatic rebuke. Instead, it presented facts. That approach carried more weight than any political argument. Canada's F-35 decision now sits in a different context. Infrastructure timelines slowed. Operational studies expanded. Dialogue with European manufacturers increased quietly. These moves reflect strategic hedging rather than indecision. Lessons emerged clearly. Ownership outweighs prestige. 
Availability matters more than theoretical dominance. Independence surpasses political convenience. Aircraft once dismissed as secondary began to look practical and forward-looking. Switzerland did not attack the F-35 program. It exposed vulnerabilities through transparency. The warning reframed the future of air power around control, cost, climate resilience and sovereignty. Canada now faces a crossroads that could shape NATO's air balance for decades. The choice extends beyond platforms and into principles. That wraps up today's video. For more deep dives like this, subscribe and hit the bell so you never miss a video. Thanks for your time and we'll catch you in the next one. Feel free to explore the other videos you see here. There's a whole library waiting for you.